We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to a random midday episode of Kirk Your Enthusiasm. I am Kirk Henderson of Pod Maverick and Mavs Moneyball. Uh, I am joined by my longtime friend. It occurred to me today that I've known you over 10 years. Uh, Bobby Corrala. Uh, what is your title there over at Mavs.com? Because you're kind of a do everything utility man. Uh, digital content manager, Kirk. Unless digital it's changed con- recently that, and no one told me. That which it could have. Because that this, honestly. This, this, the way content, the way content stuff goes, things happen in in, in a hurry. Um, yeah. So Bobby and I, uh, for those who don't know, we used to write together on a, a, a tiny website. What was it? The two man game or Mavs Outsiders? Uh, Mavs Outsider Report. Yeah, Mavs Outsider Report. A lot of kind of uh, way back in the day when the internet was all uh, scroll, like you would scroll down to look for articles. There was no clicking into new articles. Um, <laughs> back when everything was on WordPress. Uh, but so, so Bobby and I are, are, we go way back. We talk basketball. Bobby made the incredibly wise decision and one I'm envious of to, uh, get off of Twitter on a personal level, uh, this year, which, uh, as you can tell, like he's smiling, he's radiant. He looks happy every day. And it is in no small part due to the fact that he is not on the twitter.com, but that means we have taken some of our basketball conversations that were on Twitter offline where we talk over text. And he and I were exchanging some messages. There's been two or three times this year where I think we've intended to podcast about some specific things, and then I just die because of uh, you know the new baby and such. You're stretched, but, man. But you got two two different children that you can blame it on. That so, is right. That is right. One of them, one of one of them has strep today. Uh, it's fantastic. Just a real, oh, no. just a great day here in the Ender Henderson household. Uh, but one of the things that that we were sort of talking about today, you know, there's. A lot of let's just be candid. There's a lot of drama around last night's loss, of which I am uh, potentially guilty of continuing to talk about because everyone keeps yelling at me about my opinions. Um, but what we we kind of want to talk some 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 actual basketball because I was on uh, I listened to you and Isaac's live show yesterday yesterday on the the Studio 41 feed over there on YouTube. Um, you can follow it. It's, it's on the Mavs like the actual Mavericks uh, YouTube page, right? Yeah, you guys uh, do it. Yes. yes. So that was, that was a fun show, and there was some actual, like, specific basketball strategy and tactics discussion that I think was almost worth having on a different feed. And then some things happened in last night's game that sort of sped that conversation along because, you know, when it comes to to tactics and strategy, I mean, I've played basketball, and I know basketball. Basketball, there's nothing new under the sun in basketball, I think it's safe to say. However... When you are playing at an NBA level, the margins and the decision, like it's so small that I think it is often worth getting into some of the minute details to explain why coaches and teams are doing specific things that for casual fans and even seasoned fans might be missing because during the game, there's a lot that's happening that if you're not looking at the ball, 
that you're just not catching or if if you, you gotta sometimes it's really like film study is really fun that way because you go you you rewind you watch things three and four times you start to pick up on stuff and that's always been you know so the whole time i've known you you've had a really brilliant ability just like josh bow to kind of watch things one or two times ago this is what's happening and then explain it like a human being not doing the um i I'm sorry, coach speak drives me nuts when I hear shit like that's the stampede action in the Zim Zam cut. And I'm like, shut shut up. Like, talk talk to me like I'm an eight-year-old when you're explaining what's happening on the basketball floor. You're always very good at that. So well, I, I I I I challenged you about an hour ago where I said, let's let's talk about three or four things that are currently uh maybe being misconstrued with what the coaches and the, the Mavericks uh team are doing that we could maybe as fans try to understand a little better. So, so what do you, what do you think? What do you think, Bobby? Yeah. So uh, that's exactly why we're here today. Kirk is to, we're, we're not talking about narratives. No, we're talking mm. ball, man. Mm-hmm. You know, we're putting on our, our, our gym uh, shorts and our coaching pullovers and we're getting in there and uh, getting our hands dirty with some tactics. So, you know, a, a lot of this came to the fore over the last couple of games, you know, specifically what Isaac and I were talking about uh, on the live stream yesterday was in response to what happened against Boston, where in the second half, um, you know, Jake had essentially benched Derek Lively in favor mm-hmm. of Maxi Kleba. And that was a informed by tactics on both ends of the floor. But it was especially important, I think, to talk about the defensive aspect because, you know, obviously uh, your personnel dictates what you want to do, right? Mm-hmm. You have to adjust your system to fit, to fit with the players that you have. You can't take a bunch of, you know, five square pegs and cram it into five round holes. Like you have to, um, you have to run stuff that can fit your personnel. And Jake Kidd over the years has not shied away from saying that sometimes the personnel on this team might not allow them to do some of the things that he wants to do. Yeah. Um, so what does he want to do and what are they doing this year specifically on defense? And there's no better way to start, no better place to start in this era of basketball than how the Mavs defend the pick and roll. Okay. So we know just looking at the raw numbers, right? Like points per game allowed, uh, points per 100 that's allowed. The Mavs this season are below average defense at best. Um, yep. only, I don't know where they stand today in, in points per 100 possessions, but I know like they they got up to like 19th or 20th at one point. I would assume they're probably closer to 25th now. Um, and sorry, I'm going to be reading off a phone for a little while because I got no, that's fine. notes. Um, but the, the real issues with these def- with, with the way that they play defense, the real issues with their defense that are playing the team right now. Um, don't actually come in the half court. So I, I want to talk about kind of the main concepts that they're running, and then I want to talk about where they're getting cooked because in some areas they're getting cooked. Um, but here's the thing. Some, you, just some, okay. Oh, Not all of them. Some, some oh. areas they're actually good. Some areas they're average. Some areas are have a lot of room, a lot of room for improvement. I'm talking like lots of room okay. for improvement. Okay. So uh, – Strictly like half court defense, the Mavs are fine. They're a little below average this year. Uh, I'm talking like off a made field goal. When the Mavs score the ball, get back on defense, they have the 19th best defense in the league, which is fine. Not uh, quite when where they you don't want score, it, they're getting a game. lot of trouble. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So my kind of my overarching thesis for this argument is that the Mavs' defensive principles, like the systems that they are running, um, put them in a position to make plays. Right. To be a serviceable um i would even say average to slightly above average defense but the devil is in the details and that's where they're really getting bit in the butt in a lot of these games right so how do the mavs like to defend the pick and roll well defend it depends who's on the floor for them let's start whenever Derek lively is in the game um now that's regardless of who else is out there whether it's maxi at the four or luca at the four or Derek jones or josh green or tim hart or whoever at the four whenever lively's in the game the mavs typically defend pick and rolls one of two ways they either switch and everybody should know what or well sorry they switch when max is in the game uh whenever live is on the floor they either ice or they play drop now if you listen to uh kirk your enthusiasm during the 2021 season uh kirk i remember you having a lot of episodes about drop coverage back in the day well i understand now that kp just couldn't move watching him recently it's like he just got put i wasn't fair to him I don't think he nor the team were particularly honest about his health because he just, 
it's three years later for a seven foot three guy and now he's moving but they i hated it just because it was there's so many skilled shooters in the west it felt like like anybody coming off a high screen would pop like the dame lillard of it all just is burned into my brain where it's like that guy comes off a screen rises and fires and it was like an automatic bucket of course i I might not be fair the problem now is like there's a lot more guys like dame Mm. than there aren't you know dame was like five years ago pretty unique now he's not I already see people uh, in the chat saying 19th seems not fine. You're correct. 19th is below average. And where you want to be, if you want to win the championship, or really even if you want to win like more than one playoff series, is top 10. So we're going to use that as the benchmark for success here, right? Like okay. how do the Mavs get to the top 10? Or where are they ranked top 10 in defense? So drop coverage is defined pretty easily as a pick and roll where the screener defender, and it's usually going to be Derek Lively, he's the big, is going to drop way below the screen. Like he's not going to come up to the ball. He's he's going to stay beneath the action, closer to the basket, um, to limit dribble penetration. Right. Um, this the guard is going to come around the screen and he's going to see. Oh my God! There's a seven foot one guy there with uh, you know trees for arms. I'm just going to pull up and shoot like a twenty footer. Now, generally speaking, twenty footers are bad shots, but there are a lot of guys that aren't going to pull up from twenty feet. They're going to pull up from like twenty five feet, and it's mm-hmm. going to be a three, and that's where you can get in trouble. But this year, when the Mavs play, um, like it's defined as soft defense, and I don't mean mm-hmm. soft as in like they're they're like <laughs> you know wusses. It's just yeah, literally yeah. called soft. I'm talking about in second spectrum. Sure, um, classifies drop as soft. They're synonymous. Um, the Mavs are 29th best defensively whenever they play drop coverage um, out of 30 teams. So that's not very good. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. Pretty low uh, frequency as far as like how often they play drop versus icing or switching or any of these other things. But still, they do it 22 times per 100 possessions. And this year, they're defending about 100 possessions per game-ish. Right. So they do it about 22 times per game. So on almost a quarter of their possessions, um, they're the 29th best defense in the league, which is... That's going to hurt you everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can fill in the blank any way you want. Um, so they try not to play drop, but sometimes circumstances dictate it. Sometimes the other team's personnel. And you said they do that primarily when lively. Yeah. Why? So I think, um, it's hard to say. He was sold to us as, and, and I think he is, he's such a hyper mobile big man. Is it a concern for fouling? Is it a, or is it a concern for like, the cascade of what happens if you have to switch that high with the big man. Yeah, like I think I, that's that's mostly the the reason. Like they're very small behind him. Um, now I'd be curious. You know, we're starting to see a little more Maxi playing four next to Lively. I, I we want that. That is a thing that that we talk about a lot in here, Josh and I, just because yeah. I, I I think both players are decent moving laterally. And that's yeah. always your concern with a big. Like that was the KP concern because he couldn't do it then. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just, you know, one one of the things that that people forget during what made the twenty twenty two run to the Western Conference Finals work is that Dwight Powell, the guy who gets beat up the most on in our fan base, was an absolute madman with the ability to cover ground in space. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I don't see like like a um. Derek Lively is is the type of athlete I think that could do that given enough repetition and understanding of of tendencies and defense. Is that fair? Yeah, no, I and I think he'll get there. You know, I think part of it is um knowing like the limitations and this is me just completely projecting. Like I don't I don't actually sure. like know the Oh, well, it's just that's yeah. um but I think part of it is like you have to learn your own limitations of like which guys can I actually step out on? Which guys can I like kind of step out on and which guys do I need to not even try? Okay. You know, uh, we saw, you know, KP every now and then. And I, I thought, you know, I thought the defense was all right with KP in 2019, 20 and 2020, 21. It kind of fell off for a lot of different reasons, but yeah. how many times do we see KP like want to step out and then someone would just turn on the burners and get past him. And the problem in that situation, you know, if, if lively does that same thing is very similar to what happened to those 21 Mavs, which is, you know, your your power forward then was Dorian Faye Smith. Your power forward oftentimes now is like Grant Williams or Derek Jones or like Luca. Like who's gonna slide over and contest that shot if Lively okay. gets caught out of position? 
And that's why I'm kind of curious to see if they play a little more aggressively with Maxi in there because Maxi is this like weak side lurking shot blocker. That's where he's been his he's best back. since he's come back. Like mm. uh, there's been a lot. I, I get a lot of complaints about Maxi defensively, and I think it's because he's not getting to do the roaming. But yeah. when he does make a play, he's made. I, I he's only been back what like eight games, seven games. He's made take, four yeah. to four to five, like a handful of standout, like, oh, there's Maxi Kleba from 2019, like blocking somebody weak side. And I that strikes me as more of like, not that he can't do it. It's just he hasn't had the opportunity because of where he's being asked to play. Yeah. And another guy that did that earlier in the year is uh, Derek Jones. But he was doing that a lot, um, you know, before they kind of moved him to defending the point of attack. You know, he's become the team's best point of attack defender. And that's going to be a theme that's really going to, take hold in the, in the next way that they defend picks. But you have to have effective point of attack defense. And earlier in the year, they just didn't really have that. So Jones was making some weak side plays, but there was a lot of pressure on the rim because they were getting beat on the perimeter so often. So okay. part of this is not only based on how your big man is defending, it's also based on how the ball handler's guy is defending. So generally speaking, we're going to go from conservative to aggressive. The most conservative kind of defense you can play is drop, uh, where you're going to essentially funnel guys into a shot blocker and the, the theory is the best way to prevent shots at the rim is to prevent your opponent from taking them, mm. um, scare them off, essentially. I mean, it's it's to a degree how the Jazz defended with Gobert. Um, yes. And, of course, Alex Jensen's now on the Mavs coaching staff. He coached Gobert. Um, now, that, that defensive theory can be very good because it highlights your shot blocker, and, you know, Lively is a very good shot blocker uh, already. But it means that you're going to give a lot of pull-up threes. There's a lot of acreage like in the middle of the floor if you can get to like 18, 19 feet. Drop coverage doesn't really discourage um, middle penetration and you want to keep the ball you're away from You're kind of seeding that area. That's that's where you're encouraging the shots. Exactly, yeah. Which, no, I mean, good. Devin Booker was, what, 30 for 30 on mid-rangers last night? Like it was, you know, it was crazy. Blood uh, they couldn't yeah. stop him. So the next way that they defend whenever Lively's in the game is by icing a screen. Now this is okay. something that like Tom Thibodeau really kind of became famous for implementing but icing is essentially you know the big man is going to be containing the drive like he would playing drop but what the what the ball handler defender and the screener defender are going to work together to do is prevent the ball from getting into the middle of the floor so let's imagine you're uh, a right-handed player you're on the left side of the floor right so if you can get to your right hand you're on your right hand your strong hand driving middle which means you can either go to the rim or you can pass it to anywhere on the floor. Mm -hmm. Like you want to keep the ball out of there. And a big man is coming up to set a screen to get you going to your right hand. So what the ball what the what the ball handler defender is going to do is step in front of this screen, like above the screen, mm -hmm. and kind of wall off that right hand. So he's going to force the ball handler to the baseline side of the floor, to the side. Where you're line using the position. baseline defender as a as an you're using the baseline as an additional defense. Yes. And the screening defender is going to be assuming that you are going to be taking away the middle of the floor as the mm -hmm. ball handler defender. And so he will be corralling the drive on that side of the floor. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're turning it into a kind of like there's not much pressure on the ball, but you have nowhere to go with the ball. Mm -hmm. Like you can't yeah. pass it to the middle. You can't drive baseline because there's a, a guy there and you can't drive out because you're going to step out of bounds. Wasn't this, so, sorry to cut you off. Wasn't this, you made a point yesterday. I heard you say, like that's why, like defending Dirk this way was stupid because he would just take the open shot. I, yeah, Dirk would just right? pop out to the top of the arc. Yeah, he's like, I'm gonna yeah. go get this wide open shot and kill you. Okay. Yeah, and if you have a shooting big man, then you're gonna be in trouble. And the Mavs this season have really struggled. You know, it, lively lineups in particular have really struggled against stretch bigs. Um, now that's not to say again, it's not Lively's fault. It's just the mm -hmm. way that they defend. It's the system. Um, so I guess the reason I'm going over all this stuff before we no, get it's good. further into the weeds is like. I'm just I'm trying to arm everybody with the with first off the hopefully the information the and then intent. the stats, and then it's yeah. up to you to determine like are they doing the right thing or not you know um, but when they ice there's two ways to beat ice one is with pocket passes we saw James Harden slice and dice the Mavs at this many many times over the sure. years um, if you make a pocket pass to split these two defenders that are icing the screen well the middle is open at that point uh, because you've beaten the wall right like mm -hmm. you've you've torn down we, the wall. Who could do this? Yeah, yeah. Teams trying to do this to Luca, and he picks him yeah. apart. Um, another way to beat ice is with skip passes. So essentially what you're doing whenever you ice the screen is you're forcing the ball to one side of the floor, and then you can tilt your defense accordingly. So these these defenders that are guarding guys on the weak side, which is generally where your 
lesser shooters are going to be. They can come over and assume like low man roles. They can, um, they can whatever. I mean, they're just occupying space in the lane, right? To try and prevent those pocket passes. Now, pocket passes generally beat those guys if the help is late. But regardless, in an ideal scenario, you have two guys corralling the ball handler, and then you have two guys in the lane. One is at the nail, which is like the free throw line area, and then one is going to be around the restricted area. So you have just two guys there. Now, the reason that Luca is so good at destroying ice defenses is because, first off, he's tall. He's got great vision, and he's got he's really strong. So right. he slings these passes to the weak side corners. Those are called skip passes. So, sure. like, a guy is one pass away. You're, like, 15 feet away. That's one pass away. A skip pass is you're passing to a guy that's two or three passes away. And the defenses want to allow those because even though the ball moves faster than the man, you're forcing the ball out of the, ball, out of the playmaker's hands into the hands of a weaker player who's either a weak shooter or he's maybe Sometimes not. you put guys in the corner for a reason. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this season, you know, whenever the Mavs play ice, okay, mm-hmm. whenever they ice screens, they do it the fifth most often in the NBA, and they're sixth best in points per chance allowed and fifth best, fifth best in points per direct. So points per direct would be uh, points scored directly out of that pick and roll. So that's like right. ball handler or screener. Points per chance is you screen, they ice it, and then it's like, ah, there's really nothing here. And then the possession ends later, like on some other shot. So they're a top five, top six defense when they ice, and they do it uh, the fifth most frequently in the league, which is really, really good. Now, you can only ice a screen when your defense is set, right? Mm. Um, and then off of those passes, so like they force a lot of skip passes, and then we see these guys, like whoever's the low man, it's usually Tim or Luca, because, you know, no disrespect to those guys, but Tim, Luca, Kyrie, those are going to be your guys that you want to hide. You're hiding them. Shoot. You're hiding yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. So they play low man. So Tim generally is the low man is trying to draw a charge. Luca is trying to um, bat passes, you know, jump mm-hmm. passing lanes. And Kyrie has really strong hands. So he's trying to strip guys if they get the ball. So they're all trying to force turnovers um, or they need to fly like a bat out of hell to the three point line and prevent a shot attempt. Right. Uh, Which... The Mavs this season, believe it or not, Kirk, uh, they are, where's this, where's this, where's this, where's this, where's this, where's this? sorry. Um, sorry. This oh, great. they're the fourth best in spot up points per possession allowed uh, in the NBA. So spot up shooters. And Which goes back to, question. that That goes back to your point about if they actually get their defense set, they're, they're functional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And their rotations are usually good enough to at least force a suboptimal shot. Now okay. that's like a backhanded compliment. Um, the work, the job is not done there just because you force a suboptimal shot, you have to actually finish the possession. And we're going to talk about that next. Right. Um, but they do a pretty good job of either allowing shooters or allowing wide open shots to bad shooters. Like for example, Josh Akogi got a lot of open threes last night yep, that was uh, by when, their def- when their defense is functional. They're not giving up a lot of open threes to like Devin Booker or right. Bradley Beal, but when they have breakdowns, they definitely do. Um, but the, the idea is to either allow open shots to the worst shooters or try and run the best shooters off the three-point line, whether that's making them pump fake sidestep for three, which they did a lot against Utah in that series. That's how they beat the Jazz. Or by forcing them to put the ball on the floor and go to the basket where your shot blocker can recover from icing the screen on one side and get over and contest a shot on the other side. So that's like ideally how an ice defense will work. Um, and whenever the Mavs are playing well, they're very good at that. Um, again, when they're playing well and when they're set. Now, why do I keep saying when they're set, when they're set, when they're set? Well, um, those two kinds of structures, right? These two systems, whether you're dropping or whether you're icing, are very good at limiting stuff that you want to limit. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to be in position in order to execute them. If one person messes up, you're doomed. And this season, you know, the Mavs have put themselves in a lot of very precarious situations by not getting back on defense uh, effectively enough or quickly enough in transition. So this season, the Mavs are the 28th best transition defense Mm -hmm. in the league. That is third worst in terms of points per possession. I feel Um, like they've been bad at transition defense the entire Luka era. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a, they get them, they get themselves in a lot of cross match situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've said before, you know, they generally put their best defenders, their best athletes in the corners. um, And whenever you're in the corner, you have the most ground to cover to get back on defense whenever the ball's going the other way. So generally your best players are going to be behind the play. Whereas your weaker defenders are going to be the ones that are having to stop the ball. And that is a recipe for disaster. Um, Now, uh, they're also 30th in off-screen defense um, uh, points per possession. So guys that are running off of screens, like on the weak side of the floor, 
or you know maybe it's not a pick and roll it's some like elevator play or like a zipper or any sort of action where a guy is coming off a screen looking to catch and shoot the Mavs are the worst defense in the league defending those and then they're also um, 28th in putback frequency allowed which means the um, the amount of shots the volume of shots that they allow off of offensive rebounds um Mm -hmm. And where they really get in trouble, this is where their size really comes to the yeah. fore, or I guess their lack thereof. Because, okay, they've done their job. They've contained the drive, forced a skip pass, and ran a guy off the three-point line. Now he's having to take a, a, a pull-up 18-footer. Great. But everyone is rotated mm-hmm. during that possession. So you're often cross-matched with, like, Tim Hardaway Jr. having to box out Jonas Valanciunas. Yes, yes. Um, or, you know, generally... Uh, people zone up the weak side of the floor. And so when the strong side becomes the weak side, now you're zoning up. And now, like, uh, you know, I'm just going to name a random guy. Now, like, Luca is not guarding anybody. Or, like, uh, Grant Williams, like, came unattached from his man because he was icing. And now it's like, oh, where, you know, like, there's one guy in the corner. There's one guy above the break. Do I go guard either of them? Do I just get the rebound? So then you're kind of just, like, occupying space. And then all of a sudden, your man is unmarked going to the rim for a putback. You know, and so, like, the job isn't done once you force a tough shot. Okay, you have to okay. finish the possession. Um, now, and a lot of their rotations end up, you know, they end up in situations where they have one or two guys trying to box out a guy that's significantly bigger than them. Um, and oftentimes that leads to putbacks. Now, third most putbacks, um, it doesn't mean that they allow the most second chance points. Uh, they're actually better this year, believe it or not, at uh, defending possessions after a putback. Uh, or like after an offensive rebound last year, they were the worst team in the league this year. Right. They're like bottom 12 bottom. They're like 19th, 18th, something like that, um, which is fine. Uh, but they do give up a lot of offensive rebounds and that's whether Lively's on the floor or Maxi or Dwight or whoever. Um, and I would say that's not so much the fault of the big man as much as it is um, just generally the other team usually has a cumulative like foot, foot and a half, two feet of height on the floor and extra wingspan. Um, and those guys are getting more rebounds. So it's very, very hard uh, whenever you're playing at a, at a big size disadvantage to not only uh, contain the drive and all that stuff, but also to finish the possession with a rebound. And that's where they're really struggling. And those are the lively lineups. Okay. A lot of great stuff. I'm going to pause for just a second. I actually have to do what I do every show. I'm going to ask everybody that's in the stream, go ahead and go down there and like the stream. That helps me. Consider subscribing to the show. Those of you who are listening on an audio podcast, please consider uh, leaving me a review. Uh, anybody who else is here during the live stream, the video is over. If you could leave a comment, I would very much appreciate that. Uh, that helps with the algorithm. And if you are listening on an audio stream, I'm going to cut to a ad real quick. Listen to that as well because it helps me. That's how Josh and I get paid a little dollars. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hey, I'm Kat, mom of three and founder of Ritual, the company setting a new standard in the supplement industry. When I was pregnant with my first daughter, I remember staring at my prenatal vitamins and thinking, what's in this stuff? All I found were vitamins high in heavy metals, synthetic colorants, and lacking in the very essential nutrients we need. I believe women deserve to know what they are putting in their bodies and why. So at four months pregnant, I quit my job to reinvent the prenatal vitamin. We scoured the world for the best quality ingredients, backed by clinical studies and third-party tested for heavy metals and microbes. And this year, we were awarded the Purity Award from the Clean Label Project, the supplement safety certification that tests for 200 harmful chemicals and toxins. 
With Ritual, you'll know where your ingredients come from and why we use them. Join our family of skeptics with 40% off your first month when you visit ritual.com slash podcast. Okay, we're back. Thanks so much for uh, bearing with me for just a minute as I did some, uh, what do you want to call it, just accounting. So I have, I have a, a question for you before you progress any further. Um, yes. Using what you just sort of taught us and, and educated us on in the context of last night's game, I think the first half, well, the first 18 minutes of the first half were a really great example of what is happening with the Mavericks, both offensively and defensively, when things are going according to plan. It's a little bit of an extreme example because the Mavericks were hit. They hit like nine of their first 13 threes, something like that. Yeah. And, and that, that allowed them to get back on defense, get into their sets, and defend a very talented Phoenix offense. And I think they did a pretty good job. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think they did a pretty good job. They also did, we, yeah, whenever you make a shot, you have a little more juice. It's like human nature. Yeah, well, and then it just what you said is like it, the, the the ability to get set. I yeah. think more than it was was helping too. So yes, there's absolutely the juice. Um, but then what happened in the final six minutes? Uh, I I'm conflating some things, so I, I'm just just bear with me as I sort of speak colloquially. Luca took like four threes that really weren't great, or there was a, just they they didn't go in, and a lot of them had long rebounds, putting giving Phoenix the fast break opportunities. Luke also had two live ball turnovers. So all of a sudden that 14 point lead was a one point lead mm -hmm. showing like it was basically a, a, a parade of what you just described, what doesn't work for the Mavericks yeah. because they were put in all sorts of, of really tough situations. One after another, after another, that does happen in basketball. I mean, it's a, it's a game of runs for a reason, but it, it just, that was such a, you know, you know, now that I'm no longer emotionally invested in that particular moment, I can kind of understand it. It makes sense how it happened in a way that I kind of wasn't considering at the time. All right. Yeah, I will let you, sorry. No, just, I'll let you consider what can continue with your, your, uh, your, your, the next points you were, you were going for. Yeah. So there's a very delicate relationship between offense and defense and mm -hmm. between defense and offense, um, especially against a team like Phoenix, that pretty much is always going to have like two all NBA players on the floor and sometimes three going up against a team in the Mavs that oftentimes had Luca and Tim on the floor. And in a perfect world, neither of those guys is defending Booker, KD uh, or Beal. But whenever you're missing shots and the other team is hurrying it up the floor, like it's almost inevitable. Like mm -hmm. one of them is going to be on those three guys, like the law of averages is going to happen. And a lot of teams, um, you know, Boston is extraordinarily intentional at mismatch hunting. The Mavs are too. Um, there are a lot of teams that insist on running enough pick and rolls until they get to the point where they feel like they have a favorable mismatch. But in these situations where you can just go directly from defense to offense and you get the ball across midcourt and everyone is kind of in position with like 18 seconds left on the shot clock and you're Devin Booker and you look up and like Tim or Luke is on you or like in a situation where Kyrie's healthy or Jaden Hardy, or like any of these guys is on you and it's not Derek Jones, it's not Josh Green, you know, it's not one of the guys that you would maybe deem or like, yeah, get me off of him. You don't even need a screen. You can just ISO, you know, and that's what, that's what Jalen Brown did basically for the entire fourth quarter of that Celtics game. Like the Celtics shot one of eight from three in the fourth quarter of that game. It was all just pull-ups, you know, from like between 14 and 18 feet, which again, in a vacuum, if you allow nothing but 14 to 18 footers for 82 games, you're probably going to have one of the best defenses in the league. Mm -hmm. But if you allow nothing but 14 to 18 footers to guys that shoot like 55% on those shots, then, you know, it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole point is they, you know, this is not like a, this is not copium that I'm trying to sell you. Uh, again, it is like a, it's a realistic thing. So I, I have the exact stat. They're 19th in defense following a made shot. Which is not great, but it's not terrible. If you have a top five offense, it's actually kind of livable. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's you're barely below average, and these margins are like 0 .01 points per possession. Like we're talking over the course of a game, it's one extra point. Um, however, following a missed shot, they're 28th in defense. Um, so the Mavs, whenever they make a shot, are three points per 100 possessions behind 10th place. If we're using top 10 as the barometer of success, they're mm -hmm. three points worse than the 10th best team. Whenever they miss a shot, they are nine points worse than the tenth best team, uh, which is a lot. I mean, that's a lot over the course over, of the game. That's nine. Points. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So okay. 
and and then adding credence, lending credence to the they're good when they get set. How about this? Uh, this actually surprised me. Uh, so following a dead ball, so a foul or like out of bounds or whatever, Mavs are number seven in defense. Following a timeout, the Mavs are number two in defense. They have the second best defense in the league following timeouts. What What do you make of that? I don't. I mean, some of it is sample size. Like, what are their how many games have they played? Like forty four. So there's probably two hundred possessions, okay. uh, and even not even that much because yeah, probably about two hundred possessions. So it's some of it is just like puck luck. But still, I mean, my God, top one That's in really defense. Funny. Anything. <laughs> Ever or top yeah, two? I mean, top. I don't. Be, I mean, honestly, anything in the top ten, I would have been surprised by. Just yeah, candidly. yeah. Uh, but again, when they get set, they're fine. The problem is they just don't get set enough. Um, now, okay. So we've talked about dropping. We've talked about icing. Now, one thing that they don't do a lot of in general, but especially when Lively's on the floor, and that's part of what made you know Maxi's coming back in, into the lineup um, very notable, is the Mavs are switching more whenever Maxi's the five. They'll just switch the screen. And what you do when you switch is like the ball handler defender and the screening defender switch places. So like Jaden Hardy is defending Dame. Giannis comes to set a screen. Maxi's defending Giannis. Maxi then switches and guards Dame. Um, if you can do that 100% of the time, congratulations, you have built the perfect defense. <laughs> <laughs> because when you can switch everything, you just you don't give up anything. Yeah. You don't give up a size mismatch or a speed mismatch or a quickness mismatch. There's no driving lane off a screen. There's nothing. There's no benefit to setting a screen away from the ball. There's no benefit to setting a screen on the ball because the defense is just going to uh, – they're going to switch. They're not going to cede anything. They're not going to cede control of the middle. They're not going to force you baseline. They're literally just going to laugh at you right in your face. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when the Mavs switch, Kirk, this season, where do you think they rank in terms of uh, points per chance? Points in the per NBA chance when they, when they switch. Out of 30 teams. 25th. What if I told you that they were number one? What is that? How many chances are we talking about? So uh, they're 10th in switches per 100 possessions played. So they do it the 10th most times. Okay. In the, the 10th most frequency in the league. Um, and they allow... 0.831 points per chance whenever they switch. The second best team allows 0.898 points per that's, chance. That's a lot more. That's a lot more. Over the course of a game, that's like 12%. six points. Yeah. Almost seven points. Fewer. Yeah. Well, They're number one by a mile. They're also number one in points per direct off a of switch by a mile. Now, some of that is, again, whenever you switch, you're not giving up anything. So there's like really mm-hmm. no advantage to be had in a Mm -hmm. perfect theoretical world. Um, Some of it is, hey, like, genuinely, shout out to Luka. Teams have hunted him a lot relentlessly. He's played better, yeah. Yeah, and he's he's held his own in a lot of those situations. Same with Kyrie. Um, Even same with Tim. And guys, like, a lot of the targets of these mismatches have generally held their own. Now, sometimes they've held their own because they've had the help of Derek Lively behind them, that they've had right. the help of, you know, uh, Maxi or Derek Jones or whatever. But, like, that's why you have good defenders on the floor is so that they can help your weaker defenders. That's, like, the whole point. Like, Luka helps the weaker offensive players. The better defensive players help Luka. Um, so they're really, really, really good when they switch. And I, I don't know, based on now this is year three of uh, Jay Kidd as the head coach, I don't know if switching is their preferred method of defense. You know, we saw Dwight, you know, during that 21-22 season with Dorian and Reggie, uh, and Dwight was your starting big, and they brought Maxi off the bench. They would switch a lot with Maxi. With Dwight, they would switch less often. They would still do it a little bit. I think that's maybe the best vision to have for Lively. But in order to do that, you have to have really, really good backside defenders. You have to have a Dorian back there or a Maxi or, like, somebody else that's going to play at a high level that can swoop over and block a shot or can test the shot or whatever. Um, You can't kind of, you know, paperclip and bubblegum your way to a really good backside defense if you're going to have your center step out 25 feet from the rim. You know, you have to be sound behind them. And so I I don't really know what the ideal system is, but I do know that whenever they do the thing that they're good at, they're good. Like they're legitimately, you know, I mean, they're number one in switching or number one at switch defense. They're top five, top six at icing. It's like when they do the thing that they're good at, they're very, very good. It's just too often they get kind of things get derailed 
um, and they are unable to put themselves in a position to do the thing they're really good at. And that's like the most frustrating thing. So, so just, yeah. I'm asking a question that you've answered already. Circle back again to how they do the thing. Like if, if play, you know, using ice and switching are the things that they're best at, how do they put themselves in the situations to do more of that? I think um, that's where, I mean, you either take a crazy chance and you just unleash them and do it every single time. Um, Isn't that what they did in 2022 after Tim Hardaway went down? They pretty feel much like that's... leaned as far into defense as they could, yeah. Okay, because, uh, you know, that's, I make fun, I made fun of it at the time, but like, it felt like the defensive plan in 2022 from basically February 1st on was, we play real hard. <laughs> We're going to yep. switch everything. We had a great ball, ball, point of attack defender in Reggie Bullock, which allowed Dorian to just wreak havoc. Now, I, they don't really have the personnel to do that right now. Um, yeah, not really. And not that really. that kind of circles back to you have to – where this can get very frustrating game to game, it, it's, it's elements of pick your poison. The Boston game, I think – I wasn't particularly frustrated with it, all things considered, because when you're playing the best – team in the league record wise that just can you know they didn't have two of their guys that could really you know Chris S. Porzingis adds a lot to their offense it's hard to get upset about the fact that they got sliced and diced when Luca is having to guard Jalen Brown that is indicative of the the personnel shortcomings that the Mavs are dealing with against the best team in the league so you're not yeah. like it's not something to get up in arms about it's just sort of something that you understand you look to build like we're not talking about Mavericks like in a big picture sense but one of the things I've tried to pass along this year when I'm somehow in the bizarre position of being a more positive podcaster or like when you're 38 and 44 and you miss the play you miss the play and you go in a lottery becoming 44 and 38 is a huge correct step in the right direction so it's like the Mavericks have actually built a little bit it's just they haven't built where on a the fan base on a game-to-game basis is happy enough is what Mm. it is but in terms of defensive stuff i think they have taken steps it's just the personnel as we have touched on still make it difficult when your best lineups are composed of luca being the second biggest player like that's just that's hard yeah 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 and i mean whenever your best defenders are oftentimes uh whether it's by height you know several inches shorter than the other team's best player yeah, or several pounds lighter. I mean, you know, I, I think in, in a really important thing to not uh, kind of uh, an important thing to not lose in this is, you know, whenever you're icing a screen, it's not only just the big, like it's not only lively that contains the the drive. It's not only maxi or whatever. It's also the ball handler defender. Like Derek Jones is a very like legitimately incredible point of attack defender. He's very disruptive. Um, he pokes balls free. He's very good at navigating screens. Um, you know, Dante Exum, I would say is probably a little less disruptive than Jones, but is certainly, you know, pretty good at getting around screens and like, he doesn't lose guys. Guys don't lose him. You know, they don't just like shed him. Uh, whereas Josh, you know, Josh can be a very disruptive point of attack defender. He can get into guys. He also draws a lot of offensive fouls fighting through screens, but sometimes he just gets buried behind a screen, you know, and, and that is really bad whenever your big man is counting on you to be there. You know, so some of that is like the guys at the point of attack have to be a little better. Sometimes that's the big guys. Sometimes that's the the weak side defenders. Like that's why defense is five guys on a string. Um, I also think, you know, personnel wise, there are certain teams, you know, uh, I see Jay in the chat is getting very upset at everything I'm saying. So I apologize, Jay. But one thing that he said that is a little exaggeration, but is also kind of true is that, um, you know, against against bad teams, the Mavs defend better than they defend against good teams. Like that's, that is yeah. Self-evident. That's logically but, sound, yes. Yeah, but part of the reason why I think their switching numbers are so good is because they will generally only switch in a situation that is at least not unfavorable for them. Yeah. You do, know, do you think but, that there are going to be situations upcoming where they might have to sort of take that risk? Because what they've done, these last three games have been very exposing. They just haven't. Yeah, it's, been, it's been tough, dude. I mean, and it does not get easier until yeah, yeah. I mean, they switched a lot against Boston in the in the fourth quarter in that game, and and Brown made it a pay, work. you know. Yeah. But they did not switch a lot against Booker, and Booker <laughs> Booker really made the pay. So you know, sometimes you got to tip your cap, but also sometimes you have to take a chance. Now, I think you know, switching in and of itself is not conservative because it's like aggressively taking away driving lanes from the other team, mm-hmm. but like it's not aggressive 
the way that you would consider like blitzing a screen or double teaming a guy would be aggressive. Now, if you double team a guy, your rotations better be super good. Otherwise, you are going to get sliced and diced the way that Jordan Hawkins picked them apart, um, you know, without even passing the ball whenever the Pelicans came to town uh, last week or whenever that was. So, you know, you can ramp up the ball pressure a little bit, but switching, dropping, icing, it's all like relatively kind of conservative where you're taking some things away, but you're still letting skill defeat you in the right situations. Um, But I think, you know, from a coaching standpoint, making the decision to crank up the aggression whenever you don't believe that you have the personnel to do so, or whenever you believe that you you generally have two or three targets on the court at all times, sometimes Mm -hmm. more, it's really, it's a really tough gamble to make, you know, because uh, you might just get your doors blown off. Now you might get your doors blown off playing normally, but like, you know, like you, I, you kind of have to try and give yourself a chance. Um, if I were the, if I were coaching, I would say never drop if you can avoid it. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you have to just because of the nature of the the way the play unfolds. I would like to see more icing. I would like to see more switching. Um, but if they're going up against a team that just has too many guys that can make plays with the ball in the, their hands, the Sixers, the Sixers game coming up is going to be like another one of these. Like, what the hell do you do? Yeah, you do. You cannot switch. Like, mm-hmm. who on this team wants to guard Embiid? Right. And like, Embiid's going to score. Like, like not to be. I'm not being sassy. Embiid's going to score 45 points, and it's, you're it's you're essentially possible. doing like not to really go way back, but one of the one of the weird one of the earliest things of like wow NBA defense is complicated is when the Dallas Mavericks essentially dared Steve Nash to beat them off the dribble and yeah. Steve Nash was baffled by the concept and it worked yeah <laughs> and and that like they're going to do that with Embiid only Embiid is finally in good enough shape and shoots you know he has turned like guys I don't mean to make this an Embiid discussion he has turned into Dirk Nowitzki from the mid-range and he's been there for like three years and he hits like 94 percent of his free throws this is good that game is gonna be torture <laughs> yeah no I mean they they kind of frazzled Embiid um man when was this this 21 22 was the game when the rim broke or whatever yeah uh, they just played a lot of zone I yeah mean, it was a weird game, game we didn't way. know what to do yeah i mean but they don't the mavs generally they haven't run a lot of zone this season they they I don't never want really run either. a lot of like box and one or any of that like yeah. triangle and two like any of the really wacky stuff they just don't do that a lot and again some of that is like personnel like you know being as objective as possible you don't want to put luca in a compromising situation at either end of the floor uh, you don't want to put Kyrie in a compromising situation. And when you have two or three of those guys on the court, you kind of have to play safe. Like that's kind of the the inherent limitations of your personnel. So what you're trying to do is maximize your strengths. What are their strengths? Well, they have a couple good guys that are really good at the point of attack and they have a really good shot blocking center. So they're playing a lot of ice. Mm. Like they're playing a lot of, they're, they're trying to switch as much as they can when it's favorable. Like I think tactically they're doing, they're trying to do the most with what they've got. But I think uh, while still playing very conservatively, though, yes, yes. But if you want to be a little more exotic, if you want to take more chances, which I, I think like I think they might have to. Yeah, ideally, I would try and force more turnovers just because, you know, they're they're good in transition. You, yeah, the Mavs are a very good transition offense team, but they've also shown they just they don't have a lot of positional size. So defensive mm-hmm. rebounding has been a concern for a while. Yep. Um, and they they have, you know a couple weak links on the floor, like what you would call weak links. I'm not saying that Lucas sucks or whatever, but like, I don't want Luca guarding Jason Tatum. I just don't want that to happen. So what's the best way to do that? Do everything you can to prevent that from happening. Sometimes Mm -hmm. that means sending three guys in Tatum's face to force them to pass, but you can't do that against the Celtics because they'll cook you from three. Like there's some teams that you're just going to have a hard time with. You got to hope they miss, but against everybody else, you know, I I would try and up the aggression just a little bit. Um, But I think that can come in time with a little more seasoning for Lively, you know. Uh, he's been little... above and beyond expectations. Like, that's... Yeah, he's been amazing, dude. He's yeah. been amazing. But uh, I still think he gets a pretty unfriendly whistle. Um, and maybe he just needs to get a little more, like, stable when it comes to, like, all right, when should I step out versus when mm-hmm. should I not? Uh, he's been pretty good there, but let's, let's let him sure. keep getting better. Um, and then hopefully you get one or two other wings that can play out there, maybe put the ball in their hands and do something with it on offense – but that can switch on defense. Like I need a little, little more versatility, a little more size, positional size, the positional size team. stuff. I mean, it was our mutual friend, our, our former colleague here at Mavs Moneyball, always talk Franco. Kind of like it had been in my head, but now, like, but I didn't really commit it to writing anywhere. And then last year is probably the last twenty games. He was just like, these Mavs are too small. 
and it just sort of lived in my head. It's it's why you know a lot of the fan base uh, has clamored for Omax, even though he kind of played like. I know the NBA speed of the game is different, but he looked good in summer league. And then during NBA games, now he just kind of looks like a, what are those guys that are in front of uh, like the, the they're in like car, like par, uh, car dealerships where it's like those dudes, Wacky. that's what he looks like when he's on the floor sometimes. Cause he's just so boom, like there's the only one speed for him. But I think it's, that's kind of intentional, right? Like even, even, you know, kid said a couple games ago, like he wants lively to like, don't be afraid of getting in foul trouble. Like find your limits, you know, sure. like identify, identify the limits. What's the fastest I can play? What's the most aggressive I can play without getting in trouble? Sure. What's the fastest I can play without falling down? What? What's like this? this so I'm going to put you in a tricky spot here. What are the, th- and this is a kind of a, it's a broad question. We're not going to name player names, mm-hmm. but what are the things that gets that, that what, what the Mavericks are doing defensively that gets a player yanked off the floor. That's in kind of one of those um, more, Let's, let's just call it like volatile minute positions. Yeah, I mean, um, you got to be sound off the ball. You know, you can't lose your guy. Um, you know, the season is long. There's a lot of possessions, so everyone's going to get blown by every now and then. But you can't get blown by like two, three times in a row. Um, that okay. that is gonna that's gonna affect your playing time. Unless but you're Tim you, Hardaway. Just kidding. Yeah, you, you um. can't. You can't. Um, you can't lose your guy away from the ball. You have to stay engaged at all times. You know, that means that you can't be ball watching. Uh, you can't doze off. You can't. So when some of these younger guys get get ganked every now and again, and it's like, oh, why doesn't he so-and-so get more minutes? It's probably one of those things. Like, It's not an offense. It's usually a defensive thing that gets a guy yeah. crushed. Yeah, it's okay. usually a defensive thing. Now, I mean, the, the natural retort to that would be, well, if we think the defense is going to be like bottom 10 anyway, then why wouldn't you want your best offensive players on the floor all the time? Mm-hmm. Um, which is a reasonable thing to say. Um, that is a reasonable thing to say. But um, I would say the Mavs are, you know, now that they have Lively and now that like Luke is definitely a much more engaged defensive player this season for sure. Um, and in isolation has been very good for the most part. Like they have the foundation for a defense that at least will be like average you know, um, but they have okay. to make it so. Like, we just went through the numbers. In, in a lot of the things that they do, they're, like, fine to good. But in some of these things they do, they're just – they're really, really not good. And it's, it's way too dependent. I, I I wrote this last night during my very spicy, mostly correct, not at all mean recap, <laughs> where I, I, I said it's like shot making is not a game plan. Mm-hmm. It's just not. And yeah, these guys – the other way too. They've been so fueled by their offense – you know, and it's, it's, they've not had a top, they've not had a great offense in January because they're, and, and that then pertains into their defense. And I understand shot making comes and goes. And I think that's what kid has been trying to get across to some of these guys. And I just, I don't know if you can do it with guys that are more offensively themed. Like you're just like, Tim Hardaway's not going to play better defense. He will it just like in, instinctually, he's a gunner. Mm-hmm. Um, It's, it's just, it's a tough situation to be in. It explains why, if you think the Mavericks are a play-in-ish team, why you think that. I mean, I still think they're capable of being a top six team in the West because I think they have the various pieces. But this is this is one of those uh, one of those kind of catch twenty two situations where you can see the framework of why they could be very good, but they're just not there. So. Yeah, I mean, dude, a lot of it is details. Now, some of these are things that like you can't just. Like you said, you can't just magically get better at boxing out. I mean, you mm-hmm. could, in theory, but like it's unrealistic to think that like they're just suddenly going to box out every person. Like it's just probably not going to mm-hmm. happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing: so, you know, is it salvageable based on what they have right now? Maybe. Uh, you know, the thing that they're 28th in transition defense. Like I said, they're 30th in off-screen points per possession, and they're 28th in putback frequency. Those three play types add up to somewhere between like 25 to 27% of the possessions. So they're a bottom three defense one quarter of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, They're a top 10 defense, like 25% of the time. They're an average defense for the most part, the rest of the time. So can you find a way to sustain what you're doing pretty well at while limiting the things that you're very, and I guess you need to tack on an extra about 10% of the time for the drop. So they're a bottom three defense about, 35% 35% of the time. Can you cut that 35% of the time down to 31% or down to 28%? A few more possessions. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, just 
we're talking I'm talking like razor thin margins. Like how many games have the Mavs lost this year? Like Boston, 119, 110. What if they would have just boxed out a couple extra times, got back on defense a couple extra times? Maybe it's a different game. Who knows? You know, Phoenix, not not much was going to help them in that game. But some of these other close losses, it's like, dude, just box out Jonas one time or like one time. No. Yeah. Well, just what? get back on defense one time, like one time. Uh, now, under, understanding totally all this, the game. understanding all of this, how much, how much do you think the fact that you've you've missed you know you found a guy in Dante Exum and then he misses 12 games or whatever it is he's been out you have Kyrie already missing 17 games you have Luca missing I think nine at this point maybe it's not that many it's enough though it's eight eight I think is where it's at uh, there Mark Followell or uh, ABC actually I was the one I was listening to last night sorry Mavs um the ABC had a big graphic on how many games missed how much are, are there any built-in excuses with that, or do you just think that that that's something that that kind of comes with it? Because I've I've a couple of friends in national media that are like, you, you just can't you can't let that be the excuse when you if if, if you're kind of where the Mavericks are in their their process of trying to get to the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I guess like from a front office perspective, you probably don't want that to be an excuse. Um, but like, you know, and again, this isn't copium or whatever, but like, it is really hard to figure out what each other wants to do whenever you're not all playing <laughs> like they're just not all playing their ideal starting five has played the what like 50 minutes this season if that like that's really tough to do um how do we communicate in this situation um hey i'm dante what does luca like to do and that's not only on offense that's defense too um and i think there's just generally like a i mean just look at the clippers like talking about th- those things that came out whenever Kawhi and paul george were sitting all the time now that was just load management or whatever but like it, it is really frustrating whenever you don't know who's going to play and who's not going to play like it's just frustrating to be injured uh it yeah. sucks people are in a bad mood people like playing with Kyrie. they like playing with luca they like getting their shots they like knowing what their role is going to be but you guys you got guys starting coming off the bench starting coming off the bench being in the rotation being out of the rotation um, that kind of stuff can get to your head. Um, now, granted, that's only a mental thing. It's something sure. that can be overcome. It's a hurdle that can be overcome. Everybody deals with injuries. But if you're trying to establish any sort of continuity, it's really, really tough to do, especially when you're playing a slightly different defense than they have in years past with Lively now as opposed to Powell or Maxi sure. or any of these other guys. So I definitely think it's like a, a very realistic, like reasonable thing to to be concerned with. But you know, I don't know. It is what it is. I mean, I will say if you're a team that's struggling on defense and one of your best defenders has been out for a month like that, whenever you've been going up against a bunch of good teams, like that does suck really, really bad. Um, you know, and whenever you're a team that relies on offense and your best offensive players have taken turns missing the last like two months, then that also yep. sucks really bad. But hey, I mean, it's the nature of the beast. You know, you yeah. got to try and find something that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I told you I was going to keep you 25 minutes. We're now at 55 minutes. So I, I never shut up. Kirk, so. No, this is good because people like I think our fan base wants me and Josh to talk more about this. It's a little difficult in the game to game reaction stuff, because the thing about basketball is there's always another game and there's always another opportunity to come back at it. That's why when like Luca, I think it was around like game 10 where they lost one of these really frustrating ones. And he was just like, I, I don't care. And yeah. and you get it. I mean, that's where it makes a little bit of, of what happened last night just so fascinating because I think for for and fascinating is not the right word, but it's just you, you play 500 basketball for a real long time, which is what the Mavericks have done. They have not had any continuity with the even that home and they went five and two during that home stand, and the two losses were awful. They're bad, and they're bad losses, and it. All, you know, and I, I think it was uh, Coop, uh, Chuck Cooperstein, who was just like, it's one of the best home stands they've had in years, and yet everybody's being a little bit dramatic. And it's like, well, they're being dramatic because for the, the losses almost devalued the wins because they were so brutal. Um, and, and that, you know, it's a long season. What I keep telling people, and this is just my opinion, is I think that 2022 stretch from February to the Western Conference Finals really warped the way that we perceive the regular season. You're not going to win 70% of your games. Mm. <laughs> you just otherwise you're the warriors from 20 you know whatever 2016 17 warriors the mavericks should have a have an attainable goal in my opinion of finishing the season over 500 and making the playoffs preferably making the playoffs without being in the play-in but in a western conference the margin for error between being the sixth seed and the ninth seed is likely going to be like two games yeah so at a certain point, the, the battening down of the hatches has to happen, which is what makes this this our conversation, I think, interesting because it shows the cards that the Mavericks have played on defense 
while sort of discussing what options they still have to go with should things get, I don't want to say desperate, that's not the right word, but should they want to just go a different direction? So I'm, I'm really interested to see if they do that. Uh, I don't think they will. I think they'll continue the same stuff because um, I, I think that they have... I think the conservative ish approach with, with the um, personnel they have, it just leads to that. Like you, 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 there's a, you always got to weigh these things guys. And, and when we, when I get very critical, everybody gets very critical of the Mavericks. There's a lot of those discussions going on. It's what the coaching staff does or it's what they're supposed to do. They sit there and they have these discussions. Like, is it worth it to do this? And and then you got to come to a decision and then you got to commit to that decision. That's what's so, you know, that's what makes like, you know, not, not to talk about another team too much, but the Milwaukee Bucks committed to a particular way of playing that the team bucked against within four games, which is why they <laughs> no time, <laughs> no time. They were like, no, we're not doing this. Coach Griffin yeah. uh, shout, shout out to 2006 Dallas Mavericks starter, Adrian Griffin. That's um, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well bobby i don't keep you anymore um you got anything else before you want to get out of here um no i mean youtube.com whatever i don't know what the url is actually but just dallas no, just mavericks like on google YouTube. dallas mavericks and the the page comes up so it's yeah great. yeah got a bunch of podcasts player highlights videos we got an interview with Derek jones and Devin mm. harris that just came out today is pretty cool it's a, a first of two parts second part will be next week i think so you're you're, um, you're yeah always doing cool stuff and kirk i appreciate you having me on no, and uh, yeah, I, I would say my my challenge is to try and watch, um, try and not watch the ball, especially when the Mavs are on defense. Try and see what the other guys are doing. Try and see what the screener defender is doing. Try and see what the backside defender is doing. See, look at what the low man is doing. Like, try and figure out conceptually what they're trying to do, um, and then make your own evaluation from there if it's working or not. Or try and identify where mistakes are made or whatever, like where the weak points are. Um, because if you only watch the ball, then you're always going to kind of be guessing like what was supposed to happen. It's very easy to get seduced into just like watching these fancy guys dribble. But no, like look at what's happening away from the ball and you'll get a better idea of what the structure is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. All right, guys, this has been Kirk Henderson at Pod Maverick. If you could do me a favor, like I mentioned earlier, if you could like the stream, if you could leave a comment here on the YouTube page, if you're listening on an audio platform, if you could leave me a review of some form, uh, preferably not one stars, but frankly, I'll just take the engagement. Uh, this has been Kirk Henderson and Bobby Corrala. Uh, we will talk to you guys probably again one day. I always talk to Bobby. I just never actually uh, make content with him. This has been fun, Bobby. You guys uh, have a great day. Go Mavs.